everyone. I'm Jerry Punch, and welcome to our look back at the 1993 Winston Cup season being brought to you by McDonald's. Now, we're here at the Sandwich Construction Company, one of the favorite hangouts of the Winston Cup family. And it is here during the off-season that a lot of decisions are made about who's going to drive what car and who will sponsor it. And it was right here, back about halfway through the year, that my co-host and I, old BP here, Benny Parsons, we talked about what would happen in the second half of the season. And Benny, I hate to tell him we told you so, but we said, watch for Mark Martin, he's coming. We told you, didn't we tell you folks? <laughs> and he did come, five victories in the second half. Almost as many as Rusty Wallace with six. We talked about some streaking happening in Winston Cup racing. We're talking about on the racetrack, and Mark Martin with five wins, Rusty with six. But the man they were trying to streak to catch, well, he didn't win that much, but he hung on. He won three times. Daytona, Pocono, and then Talladega, and then he won the war. The Winston Cup championship, which anymore, Jerry, is so valuable. Sixth time he's won it, he moves within one of Richard Petty's seven Winston Cup titles. So let's take a look and see how Dale did it in 1993. The 1993 NASCAR Year in Review is presented by McDonald's. What you want is what you get at McDonald's today. No, indeed, this was not what the Winston Cup stars wanted to see when they rolled into Richmond International Raceway yesterday. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Despain. Welcome to Richmond's scene of the Pontiac Excitement 400 tomorrow. And guess what? NASCAR today lets me hang out in the suites today, something I never get to do. This is the Sawyer family suite. Paul and his sons took this place from a little dirt bull ring, turned it into a motorsports palace. Unfortunately, the reason we're hanging out up here is because, as yet, there's not a whole lot going on out there on the racetrack. Snow moved into the Richmond area yesterday morning, stayed all day, no practice, no qualifying, no nothing. And that has a major effect on the shape of the weekend. For example, here's your pole sitter tomorrow. If the Winston Cup cars don't get qualified today, current car owner points will set the first 30 spots in the lineup. Dale Earnhardt leads those points. Give him the pole. Ford and Chevy front row. It's Mark Martin on the outside. Grissom will challenge his elders from fifth. There's Ricky Rudd, then last week's winner, Jeff Gordon, starting seventh, sharing the row with Michael Waltrip. This week, the Labonte brothers start side-by-side by side with uh, the rookie point leader, Ricky Craven, in tow. Last week's side-by-side side sibling rivals, the Bodines, line up nose to tail this week. Look out. As you check the rest of the top 30, note that big names Rusty Wallace, Daryl Waltrip, and Jimmy Spencer, plagued with bad luck in the first two races, don't have the points to crack the top 30. Now, Alan Bestwick shares my plush surroundings. He's here to make sure I've got the rest of this right. The next four starting spots are based on the earliest postmark on the entry blank, and the back four spots are provisionals as usual. Right. Now, NASCAR is still hoping to get that one time trial session in to set the whole field. Remember, this racetrack does have lights. We could stay here for quite a while today and get it done. You bet we got lights. We'll come back here September 9th for a big night Winston Cup race. Be there, be there. We've got Bush Grand National action scheduled for this afternoon. That is the first priority to get that race in. Forecast is improving during the day today and good weather on tap for tomorrow. Let's hope that's the case. And let's talk about garage stuff. Rule change this week. Yeah, there was a rule change. The side door template for the Ford, the shape that the door has to conform to, was changed by NASCAR. They clipped the bottom off the template. You're looking at it right there. We talk with Ricky Rudd's crew chief, Bill Engel, to try and find out what that's supposed to accomplish. This is something Ford was asking for last year, really. And with the runs that we've had to this point, maybe NASCAR felt like, well, we need to do a little something that they wanted before and uh, let them try that and see how it goes. So it should put a little more downforce in the cars to make them a little more competitive in the middle of the corner. And that's where we seem to be getting beat the most. Now, Dave, a lot of the Fords don't even have the new door on them here at Richmond. It's not a very big deal on a short track. But next week at Atlanta, this is supposed to help the downforce on a Ford. They'll all have it on. Downforce is supposed to be the strong suit of the Chevys. We'll hear a lot about that next week. Going to hear a lot more from this guy before this half hour is out. But right now, I want to hear from my favorite Richmond weatherman. Yesterday, in the snow, Junie Dunleavy, who's been a car owner 100 years and lives right here in Richmond, talked about his philosophy on the forecast. Well, you know, you're always listening to them complain about the weather and all and, and, and how they would change it if they could do it. Well, up at Dover a few years ago, we had Dick Brooks driving. and we were running real good up there. And it started raining and the halfway point had gone by and we had a pretty good finish there. But uh, 
I got a little greedy and uh, said a little prayer and, and got the Lord to stop it from raining. And we went back to racing and we blew the mold and backed it in walls. So from that day to this day, I have never, ever complained about the weather. <laughs> I like that guy a lot. All that bad weather yesterday allowed lots of time for bench racing. And a hot topic of conversation was the allegation that NASCAR occasionally picks a team it wants to win a race, then looks the other way while that team cheats. We're going to dig right into that when NASCAR Today continues. NASCAR Today is brought to you by the 1994 NASCAR Year in Review. To order your copy, call 1-800-71-NASCAR. We're back and ready to deal with this week's hot potato, the allegation that NASCAR sometimes condones cheating. For years, we've heard it whispered. Richard Petty won his 200th race with an oversized motor that then-President Reagan was looking on while NASCAR was looking the other way. More recently, that NASCAR gave Jimmy Spencer a less restrictive restrictor plate for last summer's winning runs at Talladega and Daytona. And finally, the oft-repeated theory that NASCAR inspectors let Jeff Gordon race an underweight car to victory in the Brickyard 400. Well, no one is whispering anymore. First, a Virginia newspaper chain went public with the story, and then the story went national in Auto Week magazine. Now, Auto Week's unnamed sources include, and we quote, a moderately successful Winston Cup driver and, quote, a prominent crew chief on a winning team. And in essence, they claim that NASCAR periodically makes, quote, the call, unquote. In other words, they call a team, they want to win a particular race, and that team is then allowed to cheat. Well, of course, the call is not a guarantee. Racing is an unpredictable business, and there's no way to assure that a chosen car will win. The unidentified crew chief says, and we quote, they can't make it win, but they can put it in a position to win. This is strong stuff. Charges as scandalous as they are difficult to prove. Did NASCAR allow you guys to run an illegal race car at Indianapolis? No, and uh, I'm a much calmer answer in this than I was last week. And uh, no, no, that's, it's really a shame because we have a great sport and with so many good things happening in our sport, it's such a shame that they choose to write about something like that that they can't substantiate. No one's going to, no one steps up and say what kind of information, you know, it's all specul, you know, speculation. And uh, if, if they were at Rockingham last week and saw NASCAR disassemble our car after the race, they would know that they, they definitely aren't doing things like that. All right, how about the legality of Richard Petty's 84 firecracker motor? Buddy Parrott was the crew chief. I could tell you a long story about that engine. It was it was taken other places. It was torn down. It was checked. It was done. I mean, a lot of things happened to that engine. But I'm telling you right now, Robert Yates built us a legal engine, and, and uh, we didn't have the fastest car that day. Richard Petty was the smartest driver. If we miss something, it's certainly not on purpose. It's because it got by us. Uh, we uh, we couldn't afford it. That too many people would have to be in the loop. Um, I think a couple of the things that were pointed out were the Gordon win at the Brickyard and Petty's win in, uh, at Daytona. And of those two wins, um, I know that uh, Jeff Bodine had a great car at the Brickyard until he was in an accident, and Ernie had a real strong car. Uh, Kale had a real strong car at Daytona the year that uh, Richard won. Going on that this is too good to be true angle i've told people uh, several times this week that the u.s would have never beaten the russians in hockey uh bill buckner would have caught the ground ball uh kurt gibson would have never hit his home run uh villanova and nc state would have never won their championships i mean things like that happen and they happen out here too just like uh in other sports and uh, it's it's tough when you work and, and those kinds of things are said but you know it that's that's part of it with that two more questions Of course not. Does denying an allegation mean it is necessarily false? Well, if that were the case, we wouldn't need courts, would we? Fortunately, this is not a court case. Racing doesn't need that. But what we're left with is allegations and denials and no proof. No proof. So you have to decide who you choose to believe. Now another who do you choose to believe story involving the company that runs Charlotte and Atlanta Motor Speedways. You know by now that owner Bruton Smith has put Speedway Motorsports on the New York Stock Exchange offering shares to investors. 
Now, this is the Wall Street Journal, which this week voiced some reservations about this stock offering. The market analysts reminding potential investors, one, that Bruton's going to keep 76% of this company, two, that the guy has previously been involved in a racetrack bankruptcy and a failed savings and loan, three, he has a previous IRS conviction, and four, he was successfully sued 10 years ago by another group of unhappy racetrack investors. So what did the new investors decide to do? Who did they choose to believe? The answer the answer is they ponied up $75 million this week and bought up all of Mr. Smith's stock. And Bruton, in turn, went on to announce the location for his proposed new racetrack in Dallas. That's going to be at Ross Perot Jr.'s Alliance Development north of the Metroplex. That's the where. Now we're anxious to see when this racetrack will actually be built. With that, we move on. Next up, the kids are all right. It's been a great couple of races for rising stars in Winston Cup, and we'll hear from a couple of them right after the break. We're back at Richmond, rejoined by Alan Beswick to confirm my contention that the kids are all right this year. Yeah, Jeff Gordon's big win last weekend at Rockingham, a real nice thing. A lot of folks consider him to be the next superstar in the sport, but a lot of other youngsters making waves, too. Take a look at the top five in NASCAR Winston Cup points. Down there in fifth spot, Steve Grissom. Steve, did you expect this kind of success this early? Well, it's uh, kind of what we'd hoped to do, uh, to say that we'd necessarily expected it. I don't know that you can say that, but then again, on the other hand, uh, these guys on Diamond Ridge Motorsports team have been working super hard, and uh, Monica from Monte Carlo's, uh, they work great. Buddy Parrott coming over, he's really got the guys together, pumped up, working hard, so uh, all the right things are happening, so uh, if, if that's taking place, then you're supposed to run good. A lot of folks want to give Grissom's credit to Buddy Parrott, his new crew chief, but Buddy says a lot of it's the guy behind the wheel. The guy's unbelievable. You know, he just he knows when to put his nose in the place that they're supposed to be, and he also knows when to back up. I think that was the key to win the 93 championship. That, uh, you know, this is the kind of a driver you want right now. I mean, it's a perfect situation. Grissom says when Buddy Parrott talks, he commands attention. I mean, when he walks out in the shop, it's uh, kind of like E.F. Hutton speaks, and, uh, you know, everybody listens. Now looking at the second five in points, there's Jeff Gordon and Ward Burton, who says he's got the team to get him where Gordon went last week. I think this group right here, if we can capitalize on the time that we do run well and finish those races, that we can win a race this year, and that's my goal. Just outside the top ten, number 18, Bobby Labonte. If not for this spin, with 15 laps to go, running in the top five at Daytona, Labonte would be in the top five in points. You know, a lot of people said something had to break, and I said, well, I'll, I do know one thing I spun out I mean I spun out whether we find anything broke or not I doubt it and I don't really care to but I, I know I learned a lot that day and probably should have took a little bit easier towards the end of the race and uh, hopefully it kind of showed last Sunday I was a little you know got a little bit better at least I did it and kept going at least I spun out and kept going the body recovered from last week's spin out to finish second at Rockingham behind fellow young star Jeff Gordon you know, over the last few months, a lot of folks have wondered who's going to replace Earnhardt when he retires. Well, I think we found a few good candidates. Those guys are doing a great job. Another Rookie of the Year candidate who is struggling a little is Steve Kinzer, great sprint car driver, having trouble with the transition, had to use two provisionals in two races, and that started the rumor that he's on his way out. What's up with that? Yeah, especially at Rockingham after Mike Chase got let go from the active motorsports ride. Talk with Kinzer's car owner, Kenny Bernstein, on Tuesday. He said, absolutely not. Steve is the guy. In fact, they were in Atlanta Tuesday and Wednesday ready to test, although the weather didn't cooperate too well. I want to see that guy succeed. I really do. We're going to take a break, but en route to the break, I want to hear from a guy who doesn't want to replace Earnhardt. He just wants to take away his championship. You know, I, I may not hold up uh, against Dale Earnhardt, but, uh, you know, we do have a great owner, uh, Jack Roush. Uh, Steve Mill is the best crew chief in the business for me no question about that and I've got uh, a, ba a great bunch of guys who are ready for 1995 we've had a great bunch of guys before but we've never been as ready as we are for 95 so I feel real real good about that and uh, you know if uh, if we can hang together maybe we'll have something for them. We're back NASCAR today enjoying the hospitality here at Richmond International Raceway and hoping the weather will continue to shape up and we can get that Bush Grand National race in here later this afternoon. Those drivers certainly have all their fingers and toes crossed. Thus far, two races and two big stories in that division. Chad Little and engines that go boom. 
Rockingham, 10 cars fall out of the Goodwrench 200 after engine failures. There are some kinks to be worked out of the new 9 to 1 motors for a couple of reasons. First, Elton Sawyer says all the 9 to 1 engines that have been around have been pulling much lighter race cars. The engine builders have some experience in the past with 9 to 1 engines but they were in 2,700 pound cars and now we're in 3,300 pound cars. So I think that's the big difference that, that we're gonna have to work with and maybe build the bottom ends of these things a little bit more bulletproof. In trying to develop the nine to one engine, some teams have run into a shortage of parts. You know, I, I'm just a little bit worried that maybe in whoever situation that we might've got a little ahead of schedule because the truck series starting with nine to ones and all the bush cars going to nine to ones. There just not, wasn't enough parts around. So, uh, but I'm sure I know in Chevrolet's part, they're working hard to remedy that problem. But in the meantime, the R&D is happening on the track during the race. The, the race teams have got to make adjustments with the cars and being heavy and that kind of thing. The engine builders are just going to have to make some adjustments building the motors for the first time. And we've got to be patient with them and work with them and, uh, and let them do some research from, from stuff we learn on the racetrack and, and try to work with them. We're going to try to do that. We just hope that it's not something that is too costly for us and something doesn't take away from the racing because the point of the V8 was to have better races and to have more cars running when the races were over because of the unre unreliability of the V6. So I think in time the V8 will be the way to go. It's going to be a, just a transition period for the uh, drivers and the engine builders. Besides engines, Chad Little is the other story of the Bush Series weekend. We talked with him earlier. Well, Chad, 13 years of the Bush Series, three times somebody's won three in a row. What are your chances? Well, I think we're the only person that has a chance to do that right now. <laughs> That's my chances. I don't know. I mean, let's not dwell on winning two in a row. Let's just try to do the best we can here at Richmond. Um, after Daytona, you know, I said to myself, I don't want to be overwhelmed with winning Daytona and going to Rockingham and have any false expectations. And the car was flawless at Rockingham, and, and we were just dealt the right cards that day. So we'll go into Richmond tomorrow and um, uh, not have any expectations and just try to do the best we can. I think that's all you can ask for. Um, it's a brand new race car. Uh, we tested with it up here. It ran extremely well. So I think we got a shot at it, but, you know, um, uh, I just want to do the best we can, and uh, if we have some good pit stops, the luck's on our side. Maybe extremely limited practice over the course of the weekend. Now you're going to line up and you're going to run 250 laps without really getting a long run on your car. What is that? What kind of questions does that leave in your mind? Well, I'm glad we came up here and tested because we've made a long run with that. Of course, the same setups under the car now is, is what was when we tested here. If we didn't have that, it would be a guessing game, especially uh, with the heavier motors now, 100 pounds on the car. Uh, it'd be a big guess, so I think that's in our favor that I don't know how many uh, Bush teams had a chance to come up here and test, but we, um, we, we thought we had a good test here, and, and we have the same setup that we, that we tested with, so uh, we don't really have a question as far as that goes. Um, the way the car sits right now is the way we'll, we'll start the race. Chad Little trying to join some pretty famous company to win three Bush Series events in a row. All right, thanks, guys. Good luck, Chad. I am the eternal optimist. I always believe the race is going to run, and I want to take a look at the starting lineup for this afternoon's Bush Grand National Race. I'll well, check out Chad Little. He'll start his quest for a third straight from the pole. Terry Labonte alongside. Check the rest of the top ten. Sam Ard, Larry Pearson, and most recently Harry Gant in 1991. The only other drivers to win three straight in BGN. Now, on this television program, we try to do things that are new and innovative. For example, this week's NASCAR Today Fashion Report. Now, this is snowy morning styling, serious styling. Morgan Shepard looking good out here yesterday. And here's another example of what the well-dressed Winston Cupper is wearing in 1995. In this case, we're less concerned about how it looks than what it accomplishes. It's just like seat belts, fire suits, helmets. All those things are improved safety of the driver, and they can survive impacts and accidents like they couldn't survive before because of those devices. And this is perhaps the future in safety. The future in safety is this Darth Vader looking helmet restraint system. It may not be pretty, but does a pretty good job of protecting you when you smack that wall at 200 miles an hour. H-A-N-S, head and neck support system. Hans, the concept is simple. An Indy car suffers a, a, an impact of 40 Gs when it hits a wall. At that level of force, a force is generated of 1,350 pounds on the head, separating the, the head from the from the neck area. This device just prevents a motion to go through 
because of the straps right here prevents the, the head to move any further than this and the rest of the body goes with the head so it reduces that force from 1350 pounds to approximately 300 pounds the threshold for failure of the neck to the base of the head is 700 pounds so you have a margin of safety of about 300 pounds there how about this ah. Darth Vader in the flight. Well, look, it's Kyle Petty under there. Tell me about this thing, first of all, in terms of why you have elected to wear it. It looks to me like it's a bit of a hassle to get on and off, for one thing. It's a little bit of a hassle to get on. Uh, it really is, especially on a Winston Cup car. The way our seats are, it's a little bit different. But um, we started using this. I, I did all my winter testing with it. It's a Hans brace is basically what it is. And it keeps the helmet. If you, if you notice, it's, it's got all these braces and stuff on it. But I saw the video. And the video is really what sold me on it. Uh, and I think when my wife and kids saw the video, that's really what sold me on it because they're the ones that really said, look, maybe you ought to try this. But basically, it keeps your head from slamming forward or from slamming from left to right. Gives you a little bit more support in your neck area, which is your weak, weakest link. And when you go back and you look at guys like Ernie's wreck, like a couple other accidents that have happened in the last little bit, it's not that the seat moved around. It's not that they moved around a lot. It's that they had a lot of head injuries. And I think that's what we're trying to fight here. And I think this is what this helps. Kyle looking good and route to the break. I want to hear from the guy who sat on both poles at this racetrack last year. It's nice to come back to Richmond, though, isn't it? Place where he sat on the pole. Tell me about that day. Well, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, this looks more like the North Pole than anything else out here. <laughs> that day was uh, pretty awesome. You know, I uh, I really wasn't feeling good. I had a lot of cracked ribs and, you know, was hurting pretty good when I went out to qualify. And, you know, the car was just right on the money. You know, here at Richmond, if you miss it by a foot and a half getting in or you just drive in a half a car length too deep, you can be 23rd to 32nd in time. It was just a perfect lap. And uh, we brought back a different car in the fall, and I told the guys, okay, well, this may not qualify as good, but it should race good. It was just the other way around. We sat on a pole again. So three times, I don't know. We're back as usual with about a minute to go. Any last minute scoop? Jeff Gordon to announce a deal today that Coca-Cola will be an associate sponsor on his team the rest of the year. What about the hot rumor that Dale Earnhardt will drive the Indy 500? Hey, I went straight to the source. Hey, do you think I'll ever run Indy? I don't know. A lot of rumors going around. You know that? What's all the rumors? What? Who's starting in rumors? What kind of rumors? Somebody what have you been hearing? Something. I don't know. Said I've had an offer to drive Indy. You mean the Indianapolis 500, not the Brickyard? They just said Indy. Who are you talking to about it? I don't know. You have any desire to do that? Boy grew up oh, in North I Carolina. I always had desire to do that. Yeah? That'd be a thrill. How much would it cost? Say I was a car owner, wanted you to come drive my car. I don't think money's issue. I think the equipment and the opportunity's the issue. They could certainly get you a jet to get back down. You got your own jet. You get back to the 600, no problem. So what do you think? Should we uh, get our tickets now and plan to be there? I'm going for eight. Plus. <laughs> what what do we conclude from that? Is he going to do it or is he not? I wouldn't count on him doing it till after he gets that eighth Winston Cup championship in the bag. Then I'll bet that money being waved in front of him gets pretty tempting. I don't know if you can see the twinkle in his eye, the gleam in his eye. I think he wants to do it. I'd love to see it. I think it'd be great yeah, show be business. A ball. He'd have fun. He'd probably go up there and whip him too. <laughs> One thing I like about it, it leaves open the possibility that we can come back here next year to Richmond International Raceway and rehash that same rumor. Earnhardt to go to the 500. Thank you. Fun as always. Sure. Alan Bestwick, Dave Despain, fresh out of time, but we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line. NASCAR today, P.O. Box 5774, Athens, Georgia, 30604. Tell us what you like and what you don't and who your favorite driver is. Next week, we go to Atlanta Motor Speedway, 500 miles on the high bank, mile and a half. It'll be a hoot, and we'll be there live 11 o'clock Saturday morning. We'll see you next week. <laughs>